bodybuilding competitions and his 1995 National South Jersey Championship. Dr. Malala will be discussing how to structure your program to get the optimal rest and recovery time for individual body parts, taking into consideration the overcompensation principle. Key exercise to avoid will also be reviewed along with post-workout macronutrients and micronutrients for maximal recovery and growth. So prepare to be educated and entertained by Dr. Tom Malala. Thank you. Okay, welcome to the training room. If you want to have fun, raise your hand. Raise the hand up. Raise it high. Very good. Okay, because at this time you might start to get a little fatigued if you don't stay with it. So I was asked to come here about four months ago by Dr. Ken, and I do have some credentials. I haven't written any books, I haven't written any articles. I did one bodybuilding show in which I won, and I've trained a lot of natural bodybuilders. But I don't think that's really the reason why I was asked to come here. Um, I, I believe the reason I was asked to come here is because my unique approach in which I deal with my clients and my patients and most people in general. So we're gonna, I brought a little video that pretty much captures the way in which I deal with people, especially in the office, which I'll share in one moment. What I'd like to do first is just hit the overhead slide, if we could, just the actual glossy. And I want to teach you 10 rules that I want you to understand, or 10 recommendations. There you go. 10 recommendations for success for today, this next hour, and the whole weekend. Number one, breathe a little deeper. Everyone take a little oxygen in, because we're all sucking up the same oxygen up here. Number two, lighten up, relax a little bit, sit back, smile, take it easy. Congratulate yourself for being here, there's a lot of great information. Number three, enjoy yourself, meet some people. Again, just have fun. Number four, take at least, I, sh I could have put a 30 up there, take at least three great ideas to implement tomorrow or on Monday. Take at least three from today, this next hour. Live out of the box. In fact, Ken had spoken this morning about getting out of the box. Improving or increasing your comfort levels, improve your knowledge to raise your own confidence to deal with clients and patients, um, you know, if, if you're a personal trainer, the people you deal with day in and day out. Number six, increase your energy level for higher level of learning. So in other words, make sure you're feeding your body every two to three hours, keep your blood sugar up, and make sure you're well hydrated. This way you won't start getting fatigued during the course of the day or the evening. Number seven, do not let your mind say, this won't work. Because this probably already happened today. Ah, that won't work. Ah, that's not for me. You see, don't let the negativity enter your brain. Be open to all of this. This is very important information you get not to get throughout the whole day. Participate. When I say it's okay to participate, what I'd like to do <laughs> is pretty much keep all the questions at the end. I'm allocating at least 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. But if I call on you, that means you have to answer. Nine, don't be afraid to laugh. Laughter is a great thing. Number 10, and take notes. This is a great crowd. I'm seeing most people take notes throughout the day. You paid good money for this. And there's some great information. So that's important. So those are the 10 recommendations I'm going to suggest to you at this point. So what I'd like to do now is show my video. And I just want you to keep in mind that this is something that we should probably all do a little bit more often. So we've got about two minutes. Just sit back and relax a little bit. Take a deep breath and do whatever you feel like doing. Go ahead. Shut the lights off. We can't shut those lights on. Go ahead.
That pretty much sums it up. Thank you. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> now, do not go back to your clients on Monday using these terms, unless they really fit. Now, what we can take from that is, listen, we've got to be honest with ourselves and with our clients. If something is not working, don't continue doing it. If someone, let's say your personal trainer, and you know their diet's not good, you know it's not promoting muscle growth, you know it's not promoting fat loss, be honest with them. <laughs> It's very, very important. So a lot of things we're going to talk about are things that I feel truly work. So I hope you just keep that in mind next time you're dealing with someone who's maybe giving you a hard time. And don't be afraid to laugh about it. Okay. The goal today for the next 45 minutes, 45 to 60 minutes, is really to teach you how to build quality muscle. We talk about a lot of ways to re um, rehabilitate it, but I want to talk about how to grow muscle, how to build quality muscle mass. The three main reasons I feel that people do not build quality muscle, overtraining, undertraining, and they're undernourished. Or sometimes even a combination of all three at certain levels. They're either overtrained, they're undertrained, and certainly most of them are undernourished. So we're gonna address those three considerations for the next 45 minutes. I believe that there's gonna be like a revolutionary approach to the way you're training. What I'd like to do now is show some slides. This should show some of the clients I've worked with in the past, my own personal before and after pictures, so you can go, whoa, maybe there's something to this. So it can really gain your attention for the, for the remainder of the uh, talk. So can we put the slide projector on? Is that possible? That's perfect. That's beautiful. <laughs> this is a guy I trained for four years. <laughs> he had made tremendous transformation. And, um, You'll be looking to see him in the next the men's fitness, uh, I think, the next issue. How are we doing? Oh. I got to do something? Okay. Those are legs. <laughs> and above that's a torso. This is, uh, his name is Dwayne Ball. I don't know if we can put that down a little bit. But he's a natural bodybuilder. And I worked with him for about six months. And he's about 22 years old and he's never taken steroids in his life. And that's about six days out before a show. And that's good quality muscle. And he did a lot of what I'm about to speak about today. So I guess I can flick the next one. All right. There's people's heads on my friend's butt. Okay. He said, <laughs> anyway, this is my friend Eddie Hernandez, who's another natural bodybuilder. And he's one of the top guys. And again, there's some quality muscle there. Randy, this is her first show, and she did a lot of the principles to talk about as well. There's a legend. That's a legend. <laughs> wow. That's one handsome devil. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Woo! That's the, the, the side ab shot. <laughs> Flex Wheeler consulted me quite a bit about this particular pose. <laughs> um, this is January of 1995, and the pictures I'm going to show you are about five to six months later. I did one natural body one show, I swore I'll never do it again, because it was by far the toughest thing I ever did with respect to nutrition and, 
and just the discipline to run a practice and train for a show and diet properly is, as anyone here who knows, is very difficult. But I made some good changes. This is about six months later. Notice how happy I am smiling ear to ear. <laughs> and not like Eddie Hernandez, but for six months, some good changes, a good quality muscle. Never done steroids. Again, people's heads. In fact, you might recognize, I, I worked with Bill Phillips and Sean Phillips a lot. In fact, the, the 1996 supplement review book. Remember he came out with the supplement review books? I did the preface for the book, and I worked a lot with EAS, and they, that was in that shot. Notice the outfit, okay? <laughs> when you're from Jersey, you wear things like this. <laughs> okay? Spandex, shirts like this. Most people in Jersey, we walk around like this 12 months a year. <laughs> and, yeah. Okay. Where are those legs? There they are. Okay. Close-up shots. Okay. That's it. So, hope just want to gain your attention to go over what we're going to go over. So, now we're going to hit these slides here. I want to talk about what happens when you stimulate a muscle or when you train. You have to understand the physiology of what's actually, actually happening. Oh, all right. Good. So what slide do we have there? Hope they're in order. Yes. This is in your notes, I hope it is. We're getting it. Oh, yeah. Okay. What happens first, it's a little bit foggy, but we're going to get it. You're stimulating the muscle. There we go. Right in through here. That's working out. You're actually stimulating the muscle. You're breaking down the muscle fibers. That's the goal of weight training. We know this. What happens immediately afterwards is something called fatigue. And you know this, if you train legs on Saturday, if you squat heavy on Saturday, if you try to squat heavy again on Sunday, are you as strong? There's no possible way. You're much weaker. Your body has been broken down. You're in the recovery. You're in the fatigue stage. Then you're gonna go way down to reduce capacity and then start to come back up into what's called the recovery zone. Then you're gonna start to recover if everything is right, if all the nutrients are there and the sleep, et cetera. Then you're gonna reach a phase right here. It's called the overcompensation or super recovery phase, which is a unique window of opportunity for to train that muscle again. When you train that muscle, actually the muscle at that point <coughs> is bigger and stronger than it was than before you trained the muscle. That's the goal of weight training. That's the hypertrophy. That's the stress response. But what you have to understand is you have a limited window of opportunity right there to train that muscle. If you miss it, you miss it. You see? So it's critical that you understand when to train the muscle again. So let's go to the next. The training principle that really, this is a lot of, I, I stole this from Sean Phillips who stole it from I think Fred Hatfield. This is not my material. But I said, Sean, I gotta do a program in like three months, I got nothing. But I use this. So I stole this information. What happens is this, a lot of people look at graph 2A, the result of missing the window of opportunity, if you wait too long to train that muscle, you're gonna miss that super compensation, overcompensation phase. And then you go what's called into involution. Right here is overtraining, and some of us do that. You train the muscle when it's recovering. Again, you're gonna go backwards, which is obviously not the goal of training. Number three is where you hit it right. You can see like a graph going up. You're now training the muscle at the supercompensation phase, which is when you want to train that muscle. See, in my opinion, most training programs have not worked, or they've worked. I'm not so arrogant to think that nothing's ever worked before. But what happens is like in a, a typical split, like training chest, shoulders, and triceps, usually you're, you're going to train chest, shoulder, chest, shoulders, and triceps again. Each one of those muscles are going to respond or rehabilitate or regenerate or go into supercompensation at a different time. So go to the next slide. And let's talk about that. The major flaw of most programs, there it is. What will happen is, let's, let's say we train, train chest, shoulders, and triceps. You've got three different muscle groups that you're training. What you're going to see is that each one of those muscles is going to recover and go into that supercompensation at a different time. In fact, triceps will probably recover first. It's a smaller muscle group. Chest will probably be the last to recover. 
So a lot of us are missing that window of opportunity called the supercompensation phase and going into involution. Or some of us are just training so darn often that you're basically overtrained. So I'm going to give you some information today that's going to prevent that. Let's go to the next slide. So let's go over the goals here. So you can see it. We have stimulus, fatigue, recovery, overcompensation, and involution. We want to prevent involution. Anybody, at what, on one through five, when do you want to train again? What number? Who here says four? Raise your hand. Who here says other than four? Good, everyone can stay. It's at four. That's what you have to do. You have to train during the overcompensation phase. The muscle is larger and the muscle is actually stronger than it was than when you, before you train with weights. Very important. So, next slide. Back to the other slide. <laughs> next slide, sorry. <laughs> Just making sure you're listening. See, Andy doesn't like to listen to me, but now I got him. He's got to do what I say. Maybe not. So we're going to get into actually muscle groups in a moment. Let's just talk about recovery because fatigue and recovery, this is a critical component to getting big. We're putting on quality muscle. We're going to an anabolic state because a lot of us are consistently in the catabolic state because of the way we're training and the way we're eating, of course. So obviously we're going to get into more detail, but recovery, getting big, means you've got to do the right things. Good nutrition. We're going to talk about good nutrition from a macronutrient and a micronutrient standpoint. Good nutrition, there's seven components of good nutrition. There's your macronutrients, protein, carbohydrates, and fats. There's your micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, and enzymes. And there's something called water, which makes up your seventh nutrient, which is, of course, one of the most important of all the nutrients. We're going to talk about today the right balance and level of all these nutrients. Proper supplementation, we're going to touch on that. Got to sleep. Just like a baby sleeps all the time. The baby is constantly growing. We've got to get our rest. Positive stress-free attitude. You can't say enough about that. Main, I think, touch base on, you know, the mind-body connection. If you're staying in a stressed-out place mentally, if you're not doing some deep breathing, if you have a tough job, you're stressed out, any of these things are going to prevent proper results. It's going to raise your body's cortisol level from a mental standpoint. So it's important that you do something to reduce that stress. Things that will hinder your ability to recover, again, there they are, lack of sleep, alcohol and drugs, stress. Things that will help you, massage, hot tubs, whirlpools, meditation, stretching, all these will improve your ability to recover from the workout you did a day or two prior. Excellent. Any questions thus far? Because I'll, I'll stop at this point. Hot tub after training. Is your girlfriend with you or is she, where is she at? <laughs> Your wife. Okay. <laughs> Who would you prefer to, to bathe with? Perfect. Do they know each other at this point yet? <laughs> In your case, I suggest you be honest with them. Let's go. Let's play the movie again. No. I say we just get on the table. Hot tub after training. Who here says yes? Raise your hand. We think it would be a good thing. I think it would be, I think it would probably help recovery. Yeah. Because I, I had a lot of stuff after the workout. Yeah. I had a protein shake and Yeah, I think that's great. That's perfect. No doubt. Just make sure you're going to drink enough water. You know, make before and after, maybe it's inside. Perfect. And in my opinion, if your girlfriend and wife are in there, I would, I would booze it up. It says no alcohol. <laughs> I think in your case, booze is going to help you. A lot of liquor. Would you agree with that? Okay. So now that I got you somewhat sold on variable split training, I'm going to tell you that each body part is going to rehabilitate and respond at a different pace or different frequency. Just like you can't, you can't feed a mouse and an elephant the same amount. You see... An elephant would starve on the same amount that would make a mouse real fat. Likewise, you cannot train legs every other day. You'd go into a immediate state of overtraining. If you train biceps once a week, 
You ain't going to gain results. So we're going to talk about these things. Let's go to arms, arm training. My opinion, arms can and should be trained three times per week. But here's how you got to do it. On Monday, you're going to train with what's called low intensity. And when I use the word intensity, think more about weights or resistance. It doesn't mean that you're just whip de do. You're training at a fast pace. You're getting higher reps, 8 to 12 reps, with a one-minute rest in between. You're going to get a good pump and a good flush into the muscle. One exercise, three to four work sets of your biceps, and that's it. Warm them up, three exercises, maybe four, and that's it for biceps. Triceps, same thing. Okay, let's go to Wednesday training. Wednesday, you're going to do biceps again. In this case, it's going to be more of a moderate weight, more of a typical type of training routine. About a two-minute rest between sets. You really want to concentrate on your form, maybe do some negatives at that point, and maximally contract through the actual concentric portion. On Friday is your max day. You pick one exercise, you want to do two sets. In this case, it's going to be something like a standing barbell curl or a close grip bench press for your triceps. This utilizes something called an index of overall demand through the week. And it works. And there's a chart that's going to get into that. So Mondays, low intensity, high volume, more reps, less rest between sets. On Wednesday, more of a moderate, typical type training, maybe two minutes between each set. And on Friday, you're going to take three to four minutes between those two heavy duty work sets. Now, just because I say high intensity on a standing barbell curl does not mean that you cheat and you throw yourself back and do all those things that they said not to do this morning. You still have to concentrate, have a good spotter. You still have to stimulate and isolate that bicep as best you can. Very important. You do the same type of training with triceps. Chest and back. Interesting. Chest and back are going to be trained on, let me get this exactly right. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, but here's how it goes. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, you're crazy. Listen, chest, for the first week, chest is going to be trained on Mondays and Fridays. The second week, back will be trained on Wednesday. It'll switch. Let's do chest first so I don't confuse myself, which is very easy to do. On Mondays is going to be your intensity day. And we're going to train chest, you're going to see chest, shoulders, triceps, and biceps on Monday. Chest is going to be your high intensity day, or Monday's your high intensity day for chest. So this is the day you're going to go all out. Once again, take a lot of rest between each set, three minutes or so, and use a heavier weight, maybe five to six reps. Do not sacrifice form. What exercises? I really don't care. Just don't do anything stupid. Do the exercises that are going to put on some muscle growth. That's on Monday. Monday is always a high intensity day. Why? You had Sunday off, and on Monday, you'll also be training the arms with a lower intensity. So you're going to the gym that day. You really only, you have to train one body part intensely that day. So Monday and Friday, the first week would be chest. The chest will recover by Friday. Your Friday day is a moderate, high volume, low rep day. I'm sorry, moderate, high volume, low intensity. Friday is going to be your less weight day, more volume. So on Monday, you really use some heavier weight. On Friday, not as heavy a weight. More repetitions, moderate weight. That's Mondays and Fridays. This is in the notes. Wednesdays, go ahead. Oh, is that okay? That's the answer. Let's bring him right up here. I'll take it. On Wednesdays, it's going to be, you're going to start with like some low reps and work up to some high reps, or even the opposite. Um, you're going to really be breaking up the type of training that you're doing. But the most important factor is that you hit that overcompensation principle. Do not wait for involution. You have to continue to catch that muscle when it's ready to be, to be trained again. Shoulders. What about shoulders? Here's my take on shoulders. Number one, shoulders are the most overtrained muscle. It just happens. When you're doing other body parts, shoulders are stimulated. So in my opinion... We're going to work front delts. Ooh. Can you hear me, Mark? Front delts with your chest day. Now, some may say, well, hey, I just did chest real heavy on Monday. How am I going to really press hard on shoulders, on delts? 
listen, that shoulder joint is too damn fragile. Don't worry about heavy duty pressing with your shoulders. You're gonna get stimulated from the heavy benching or barbell presses or dumbbell presses, whatever you're doing. What I suggest for all shoulder exercises, I'm a big fan of dumbbell side raises and Arnold presses. Eight to 10 repetitions, really feel the muscle and go, go relatively slow. Don't, don't ballistic, you gotta really stay in good posture for a, sh a good shoulder training. So in other words, if you're a little blown out from your chest workout on your front delts, don't worry about it. We're just looking to stimulate this muscle. So train anterior and middle delts on chest day. Train your rear delts, one of the most forgotten muscle groups, on back day. And for rear delts, use 10 to 15 reps, use a moderate to lighter weight, and on this particular muscle group, you've really got to feel the contraction, because it's a hard muscle group to feel. Most people here, or not maybe here, but most people who train have really never gotten a good stimulation on their rear delts because they haven't been in the right position, the right posture, they're using too much weight, and they're not squeezing that, that small muscle in the back of the shoulder. And without a good rear delt, you won't look right. And, Mar and, and Dr. Mario was you know, describing the, the gorilla guy this morning because he's never trained in rear delts or traps or rhomboids. So in other words, train your rear delts on back day. One suggestion I want to make, in fact, is what I do, is I train my rear delts first before back. Because if I train my back first, I'm too blown out and I can't make a strong, that strong of a muscle, a mind-muscle connection as I can if I do that right from the get-go. So I would suggest rear delts are trained with back and do them first. So that's my take on shoulders, unless I left anything out. That's it. Here's the beauty of this program. Who here would rather train legs than arms, raise your hand. Okay, just a few wackos. Some young nuts. Who here would much rather train arms than legs? Raise, your, raise them high, show the world. Okay? The beauty of this program too is that you're training the tougher body parts once a week, which is legs. Legs are done once a week. I suggest Saturday morning, alone, by themselves, get it over with, train intensely, go home, Take a jacuzzi with your girlfriend, your wife, the next door neighbor, and just relax for the rest of the day, and you have Sunday to recover from the heavy duty leg day. How do you train legs? Intensely. What I suggest, I'm a big fan of the barbell squat, and a one-legged type leg press on the machine going very slow up and down. I'm really into slow training. I've done a lot of Mike Mentor type training. I don't suggest that for everybody. You see, but going slow makes a difference on the concentric and the, and the eccentric contraction, especially when you're training legs especially hamstrings. And calves can be done that day as well. And you'll see on the schedule, you know, I put down calves once a week. Obviously, we all know calves can be trained more than once a week. What did Arnold say about calf training? How often can he train calves? Who knows? How often did Arnold train calves? Did them twice a day. You see? Now, if you're a bodybuilder, you might need to do them twice a day. But what I'm talking about here, I'm talking about the 99% of the, of the population I want 99% of the population to be able to do this workout. The 1% who's a bodybuilder, a high level power lifter, that's a whole nother story. But I'm telling you, any intermediate or advanced bodybuilder or trainer can do this program and get phenomenal results. Better than you can ever imagine. So a quick take on what a schedule might look like. Monday, there it is, chest, shoulders, triceps, and biceps. There's your heavy duty day for chest. We're going high intensity. Intensity means heavier weight. A lot of rest between sets, maybe three minutes. Shoulders, there they are. You're gonna train your front and your mid middle shoulders, your medial deltoids. I suggest like a lateral raise, eight to 10 reps, really feel that muscle, use good form, keep those scapulas down, and really feel that muscle. You do not need to do power shoulder training. Like I said, the joint's gonna get beat up after a while. And this is just from experience. Triceps and biceps. You notice I'm gonna do triceps before biceps on that day. Pick one exercise for triceps. This is the day we're doing less intensity, more volume. Same thing for biceps. Tuesday, day off. Rest and grow. Get a massage, eat, relax, meditate, do everything you need to do to keep cortisol levels down and you can stimulate muscle growth. Wednesday, there it is. Back, shoulders, biceps. Same type of situation. What exercises do you wanna do? It's up to you. Thursday, day off. There we are, Friday, chest day. So now we're gonna train chest again, but this is more of a lower intensity day. We're not gonna be putting a lot of weight on the bench. And there's the triceps and biceps. Now, real important, this is the day for triceps and biceps. 
two sets of something heavy, high intensity, like a standing barbell curl or a close grip bench press. And it's nice because then you have Saturday and Sunday to recover from those, ex from those exercises for those two body parts. Because here, how does this thing work? You have one day, arms, one day rest, arms, one day rest, arms, and now you have two days rest. So that's why I'm putting Friday for your heavy duty arm day, to give your body two days rest. Any questions at, that, at this point on that stuff? They do. I'll go over it. If there's time for aerobics, I'll give my take on aerobics if we're looking to get lean. Any questions on this? How about abs? How about abs? I'll go over that later, too. Can you demonstrate your, what your interpretation of the proper lateral raise, the shoulders, the I would. We have dumbbells here? I got blown out the uh, super spinatus real bit. I will if we have like light dumbbells. I will not do heavy dumbbells. But I will at the end. Let me do it at the end. No, but does that make sense so far as far as involution, avoiding it, super compensation, how to train four days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, split, training legs, Saturday alone, and all that other good stuff. Does that make sense so far? Raise your hand. Beautiful, so I won't lose anybody. Any questions pertaining to that specifically? Are you taking into account different people's metabolic rates and also their recovery? That's already been taken into account when these studies were done. Really, Fred Hatfield and Sean Phillips did a lot of that research. Yes. Yes. In other words, do we want to do some exercise to strengthen the rotator cuff? Absolutely. I highly recommend before doing any upper body that you're going to go ahead and do some rotator cuff strengthening exercises. How many sets uh, for like back and chest? Good question. How many sets for back and chest? Because I gave some information on arms. Personally, for chest and back, I do four to six sets and that's it. I pick out two exercises I like to do and do two to three sets. But I go kind of slow. I do like a 4-4, four, 4-second four, four concentric, 4-second eccentric type contraction. But I wouldn't suggest doing 12 to 15 sets like most of us are used to doing. You don't need to. You're going to overtrain. You're going to be spending too much time in the gym, not, not enough time with the food and the rest in front of you. Four to eight sets will get the job done. How many consecutive weeks? About eight. Six to eight weeks, take a week off. Good. Is it okay if I move on? Great, good questions. One more. What is your work schedule? You've got to quit your work. <laughs> I mean, you're still working? <laughs> Andy, I didn't know this movie would have jobs and stuff here when you hired me. I'm sorry. The question is, I'm a kid. Can I get you okay? What do you do about work? In other words, how do you fit this into your schedule? Now you really have to quit your job. <laughs> you can. I'm trying to give you an ideal way. You can still kind of make this mesh into your life, so to speak. You see, that's the hard part, is how do we make this fit into our life? Because again, I'm talking about the 99%, not the bodybuilder, not the power lifter, not the elite athlete. So ideally, I like training legs alone on Saturday, because I wake up, that's, I, that's what I have to do, I get it over with, it's done. Monday through Friday, I'm working with patients, I'm taking phone calls, I have 12 to 14 hour days. Those are, that's not a day I personally want to train legs at 2 in the afternoon and then see 30 patients at night. I'm dead. So in other words, are you off on Thursdays? No. Can you take off on Thursdays? Can you take off Mondays and Tuesdays? <laughs> In other words, I would suggest that you definitely take off, take off as much as you can, join my friend in the jacuzzi. <laughs> How many uh, does that jacuzzi fit? Uh, you can squeeze a few more. No problem. How long, how long does a typical Monday, Wednesday, Friday strength training workout take? Good question. No more than 45 to 50 minutes. 60 minutes max. Because keep in mind, for buys and tries, you're doing two, or three, you're doing two to three sets. For shoulders, I'm doing maybe two to three to five sets. I'm not doing a lot of sets, man. Realistic in 30 minutes? 30, no, I didn't say 30. Is it realistic? No. Ah, that'd, be, that'd be pushing it. But again, you know what? To do this concept, we're still looking for involution. If you can only get two sets in the body part, or three, three sets per body part, but follow this protocol, you're going to get gains. One more. Right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So what I do is check shoulders, 
Okay, here's the first question I'll ask someone who tells me this. Are you happy with your progress? Yes, I am. Then it works. That's what I said. In my opinion, because I've trained for 20 years, I've trained all different types, this training works best for me and the clients I work with. So, let's get into now how you recover. What do we need to do when that slope is going down or in the recovery fatigue phase? What do we need to now do? This is a little crude, but it will work. First of all, the first thing you have to ask yourself, how much energy do I need? How many calories do I need? Here's a crude assessment. Slow metabolizer, medium metabolizer, fast metabolizer. Now, this is in your, in, in your notes. I said, Ken is gonna be copying some more stuff. We have some more slides. Don't freak out when it's not in your notes. You're gonna get them today. So in other words, if you're a 200 pound man and you're a medium metabolizer, in other words, you're not really obese, you're not like a heavy guy and you're not a real like ruler, you're a regular, what was that, a mesomorph type looking guy? You're 15. 200 pounds times 15, you get 3,000 calories a day. That's a good estimate of how many calories you need a day. That's your 100% mark. So, what's the next one there? So here's what we do. Let's see what the next one gives more information. Let's, let's go back to that. I'm sorry, the third one, after, the next one after that, Andy. No, after that one. There's got to be more. No, forward. Always forward. There we go. Okay. This will be coming. It's being copied right now. So you're 200 pounds. Give yourself a coefficient of 15 if you're normal, average 3,000 calories per day. Now you have to determine what your goal is. So let's read this. If your goal is to lose body fat while simultaneously adding muscle, you should randomly vary your daily caloric requirement from 70 to 100% of your estimated caloric requirement, blah, blah, blah. For example, 3,000 calories, 70% of 3,000 calories is 2,100 calories. On 100% is 3,000. Here's what I suggest you do. Every other day, one day you have 3,000 calories, the next day you have 2,100 calories. Then back to 3,000, then back to 2,100. Now this is not for everybody. This could drive some people crazy. These are for people who are at another level perhaps and want to get gains and results as quick as possible. So here's how you do it. But if I lift this out, I'm not going to be all the information I feel is important for building an awesome physique. So there you have it. This is if you want to gain muscle and simultaneously take off body fat, which is most people. 3,000 calories one day, 2,100 calories the next day. Now, if you're saying to yourself, oh, I need more than 3,000 calories, you might. You might be times 17. You might. Now, if your goal is to gain muscle mass without losing any additional body fat, I recommend you randomly vary your energy intake between 100 and 125% of your estimated caloric requirement. For example, you're 180 pounds but you're six foot one as a man. You know you want to pack on some muscle. Well then, 180 times 15 is 2,700 calories. 125% of your estimated caloric requirement is 3,375. So once again, you're gonna stagger. On Monday, maybe do the 2,700 calories. The next day, do the 3,375. Keep staggering. If you don't see that you're putting on quality muscle, you may have to increase your calories. But again, this formulation, this rule works 90% of the time. So that's how you determine your calories and then determine what you want to do with your body. Number three, break down the profile for each meal. How many times a day do we need to eat? Six, five to six times a day. Six times a day is the answer, but you can still get some good gains eating five times. And five times in of itself is a challenge. Would you agree? If you agree eating five times a day is hard enough, raise your hand. Raise it up. It is. So what you want to do is you want to take your caloric requirement, 2,100 calories, divided by five meals, you're looking at about 420 calories per meal, ideally. Meal patterning, this is called. If you've got a 3,000 calorie day, divide that sucker by six, you've got 500 calories per meal. So let's see macronutrient profiles. So we'll go to the next slide. There's a lot of controversy on how much protein, how much carb, how much fat. This works for me. This works for most people, I find. I recommend 35 to 40% protein to build quality muscle. 40 to 45 percent in the form of carbohydrate. And most people can do about 20 percent fat. Some people can do 30 percent fat, 33 percent fat. Dan Duchesne says the isometric diet's the way to go. Listen, I find I get lean on 20 percent fat. If I'm looking to get super duper lean, bodybuilding type thing, I even bring it down even more. But a 40, 40, 20 or 35, 45, 20 works. If, some, if you feel that would work, raise your hand. 
if you've ever tried this. It works. I'm telling you, it works. So what do we do with this? Now let's say it's a 2100 calorie day. Let's do a 40% protein. It's 210 grams of protein per day. It's the same amount for carbohydrate, 210 grams for carbohydrate. And 20% fat is going to come to 47 grams per day. On that 3,000 calorie program, we're looking at, let's do 35% protein that day. You see the numbers, 252, 337, and 67 grams of fat. Should we raise that last part up a little bit, Andy? Thank you. Okay, now here's the tough part. You want to do this really right, this is what you do. But don't freak out. It's all about portion control, so you want to really break down a 3,000 calorie day and divide your calories through the day, of course. You don't want to do 1,000 calories three times a day. But if you really want to do it right and get an unbelievable change in your physique, and get better results than ever before, you do the overcompensation principle and this principle, your meal pattern. If I need 210 grams of protein a day and I'm doing five meals, it comes to 42 grams per meal. What is 42 grams of protein? That is about six ounces of chi uh, six ounce chicken breast. It's a normal serving. What are most of these nutrition shakes today, protein shakes today, are about 37 to 45 grams of protein per shake. Hey, works out pretty good. 210 grams, it's 42 grams per meal. Like a sweet potato, it's about 6.5 grams per ounce. So it's about seven ounce, seven ounce sweet potato. It's a medium sized sweet potato. If you're doing a shake, you could put maybe a little fruit in the shake because there's probably about 20, 25 grams of <coughs> carbohydrate in that shake. Put a little fruit in there. If you're going to get extremely lean, you won't get extremely lean on fruit if you want to get below 6%, 7% body fat. But if you want to make your life easy, which is what I'm helping to share here, put a little fruit in there. You're going to have a nice meal. 47 grams of fat divided by 5 is 9 grams per meal. Where should fat be coming from? What sources of fat are best for muscle growth and health? Flax oil, very good, because they contain what? The essential fatty acids, little egg, little linic acid, which everybody should be taking, or at least or you got to do fish every day. But that might not be too good either because of the potential toxins in fish, you see? So you got to be doing flax oil. Another good source of a growth fat is actually comes from red meat. You know, if you're a guy here and you train, who here knows that when they eat red meat, they grow? No doubt about it. So... Ladies too. I mean, if you're looking to put on muscle, get your fats from red meat, lean red meat, <coughs> and flax. So there's the meal patterning. Next slide. <coughs> supplementation. We could go on. We could do a whole program. We could do a whole day on supplementation. <laughs> oh boy, that would be a good way to go. Woo! That Ming. Where's Ming here? Oh God, help me. Anyway, anabolic supplementation. Hold on, give me a few more minutes. Number one, creatine. Everybody here has heard of creatine. Most people here have taken creatine. Creatine works. I'm not going to go over my favorite brand, but creatine works. Get a reputable creatine. I believe that the load phase is important. Some people say, I don't need the load phase. Muscle Fitness says, ah, oh, Joe Weider, Bill Phillips is trying to make money on the load. I believe the load phase is important. When I recommend creatine, I recommend the load phase. Does everybody here know what the load, anybody not here know what the load phase means? Which means simply this. For a certain period of time, you need to really load up on the creatine. For example, load phase, 30 grams a day for about five days. And you take that in divided dosages. So about six grams a day, five, you know, five times a day. That's a lot. It's, I could have put 20 to 30 grams. But I'd rather give you too much than too little. A lot of times what I do is look at the label and put a little more in seem to work. Maintenance phase, 5 to 15 grams per day. When's the most important time to take the creatine? Post-workout. Post-workout, exactly. Your muscle cells are going to be like sponge and magnets to suck in the creatine. Creatine is a necessary nutrient for recovering muscles, for regenerating muscles, for getting bigger. Glutamine. You need glutamine. There's people who take even more than 5 to 15 grams a day, but glutamine, in my opinion, I get better results from glutamine than creatine. Glutamine is the most abundant amino acid in the body. They don't, it's not an essential amino acid simply because your body can make it, but it doesn't mean you don't need extra glutamine. If you're training with weights, you need glutamine. If you're running more of an acidic, if you have an acidic type of diet, if you're doing 250 grams of protein, you're going to have an acidic type of diet, glutamine can help balance your body's pH. Glutamine is important for your digestive tract and your immune system. 
You see, what happens is, if your digestive, tree, your digestive tract, the epithelial cells of your gut, utilize glutamine as their main source of fuel, your immune system is fed by glutamine. If you start running low in glutamine, or if you start feeling sick, guess where your body's gonna go and get glutamine? Your muscle cell. Just like it'll go to the bone for calcium. You see? So glutamine, five to 15 grams per day, divided dosages, key, post-workout, before bed. HMB, I believe HMB works. In fact, the harder you train, the more necessary it seems to become. HMB is a derivative of the amino acid leucine, one of the branched chain amino acids. We used to say branched chain amino acids all the time. This is, has been found that it's HMB and leucine that has the most anti-catabolic effect, which other, in other words, it means helps, helps, helps prevent you from losing too much muscle. If you're training intensely, definitely need HMB. Vitamin C. Personally, I take five to six grams of vitamin C a day, divided dosages. Helps with collagen repair and helps to prevent cortisol excess in the body. Divided doses once again. Multivitamin mineral. Can we bring it up just a little bit, Andy, toward the top of the screen? Thank you. <clears throat> I'm big on taking high quality vitamin mineral preparations. Now, men, go home, check your multivitamin. If you see iron in there, throw it away or give it to your sister or one of your girlfriends in the jacuzzi who is hopefully still menstruating. Hope you're not in the jacuzzi with a postmenopausal woman. <laughs> Are you? Very good. Because if I go to his house and he's got a seven-year-old lady in that jacuzzi and he's bragging in front of all you people, there's going to be hell to pay. Okay. <laughs> Iron will build up in a man's body and it can be that very detrimental. It creates free radicals in the body. You don't want it. Six, antioxidants. We can spend a whole day on antioxidants. Basically, if you choose an antioxidant formulation, the key nutrients you're going to be looking for are vitamin E, selenium, N-acetylcysteine, glutathione, grapeseed extract, and lipoic acid. Personally, I take two to four a day. I usually take two in the morning, empty stomach, two post-workout. But at least get one a day. With the amount of pollutants and toxins in the air and the amount of muscle breakdown that you're going to go through when you train, antioxidants help protect your DNA and your muscle cells. Water. I mentioned that as the, one of the top nutrients. Water, if you're not drinking enough water, you will never get results. The water is like a river that runs through your body that's going to deliver the nutrients to your cells and remove the waste. Muscle, you know, is 73 to 77% water. You know that when you're drinking enough water, you have that full feeling. When you're dehydrated after you drink all night long, maybe in the jacuzzi, you just had too many, there's chicks everywhere, you wake up flat as a pancake. You ever had that experience? Yes, he has. What's the first thing you go for to get your body going again? More water. He wants to drink water, so hey, maybe the next time he wants to booze it up all over again. Go for it, but you gotta drink the water. How much water? 60.66 is a good co uh, coefficient. If you're 200 pounds, you need about 132 ounces of water. It's about a gallon, or it is a gallon. It's about a gallon of water. Here's a key. What I find very, very effective and very important, first thing in the morning, at least 24 ounces. You haven't had water for six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours. Your body is thirsty for water. At least 24 ounces first thing in the morning. Plus, now you're ahead of the game. So very, very important to consume enough water. Deliver the nutrients to the cells. Extremely important. Now, let me talk about cardio or an ab training, and they'll take on some questions. Here's my take on cardio. Ming said the same thing. When I do cardio, and I'm, I'm working with someone who wants to do like a bodybuilding show or get as lean as possible, I believe in more of a high intensity training or interval type training, which might look something like this. You walk for a minute to two minutes at a, at a, at a good pace, and then you want to increase the pace of a run or a walk or a jog or whatever for 30 seconds, relax, walk, and then keep building upon that. I'm sure you've, some people here know the Body for Life book by Bill Phillips. He talks about interval high intensity <coughs> training. That is the best way, in my opinion, to shave off body fat and not lose precious muscle. Being on a treadmill for 45 to 60 minutes or a bike, no matter what you've learned in the past, does not do the trick. You want to bring up that metabolism to burn body fat. When is the best time to do this cardio? First thing in the morning. Before or after you eat? Before you eat. Empty stomach. Everybody knows that. I thought I'd never be able to do it. I'll be too hungry. It's awesome. And then you want to wait how long afterwards before you eat? About an hour. That's right. 
you'll still keep burning body fat through the day. It puts you right at the, the proper hormonal setting to burn fat. Your insulin levels are low and your glucose levels are low, so your body has no other choice but to go to your fat cells for fuel for energy. And which has a higher octane, carbohydrate or fats? Fats. Fats are a better fuel to burn. So first thing in the morning, drink your 24 ounces of water, wake up, get out of the jacuzzi, get in the jacuzzi, and go walking. And then do that HIIT training. I do it for 15 to 18 minutes. I hate it every morning, but I feel much better afterwards. I call it mind over mattress. <laughs> Wind over jacuzzi. What else are going to talk about? Oh, ab training. I believe abs to be trained two to three days a week. You need a day rest in between. I find that the best way to train abs is actually, you ever see on TV that ab tracker type thing? You ever see that? Well, not with the ab tracker, but like with the roller. And if you can do it on certain angles, because you're going to get an eccentric type contraction, because I've seen people do crunches and this and that and sit-ups and hanging leg raises. And again, it's so hard to, to isolate that rectus abdominis muscle with the psoas that I find, once I started doing more of the roller type thing, it's that it was big in the 70s. You ever know what I'm talking about? The wheel with the stick, roll up, you know. Then you put your legs up, put your legs down. It's awesome. Two, three days a week. It takes five to ten minutes. Great, I, I think I've used that once, awesome. But unfortunately, when I finally get a chance to go to the gym now, I got 35 minutes. So I try to do my ab training for five minutes at home. So I'm, I'm in and out of the gym, that's all, I, that's all the time I have. But if you have access to awesome equipment in the gym, certainly utilize it. And abdominal training or abdom quality abdominal muscles are built with resistance. So you, get, you have to use some weights usually. Now a woman might not want to do that and get those blocks. Maybe she just wants to get a flat tummy, that's a different story. But a man, if you have the immature abs, you've got to use some resistance. That's my take on abdominal training. I think I covered what I wanted to cover. Now we've got 10 to 15 minutes to do questions and answers. This worked out perfect. Mm, good question. This question was, when you're calculating your protein level, say you need 250 grams of protein, um, are you counting like protein you might get from like a sweet potato or something? You, you, you actually you do. I think it's like five to six grams of protein from a sweet potato. But I understand that that's not um, a complete protein and it should, be, it should be consumed with a quality complete type protein. Good question. Yeah. His question is, after a post-workout, um, should your carbohydrate intake be a little different? Should be a little more? And the question is, if you're a hard gainer, if you're looking to put on muscle mass, I think that's an opportunity to feed your body more. And some people, 80 to 100 grams of carbohydrate. You have like that 30 to 60 minutes that's non-insulin dependent to shuttle glucose into the cells. But for most people, again, I find their ultimate goal is to get leaner. So sometimes I'll even suggest for 30 to 60 minutes you do not eat. You consume plenty of, uh, plenty of water and then have a carbohydrate protein meal. But for a hard gainer, young guy, you're looking to put on 10 pounds of muscle next three months, consume substantial amount of carbohydrate post-workout. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and you, you will, you'll fill up and you'll know. And you, you'll kind of know, if you're inherently lean, you'll know you're, you're, you're consuming too many carbohydrates if you're very vascular and start using, losing your vascularity. Then you're spilling, you see. But if you're vascular and you're lean, you can consume those carbohydrates. And there's certain people, like 15, 20% of the population, boy, they do great with carbs. They can keep on carbon up, but that's not the majority. Are EFA capsules any good, or do you go with the liquid? The EFA capsules are good, but the problem here is that one capsule is usually 1,000 milligrams or one gram. And we're talking, you know, a guy needs 40 to 60 grams of fat sometimes, sometimes even more. That's a lot of pills you've got to swallow. So personally, it's more cost effective, it's safer, more bang to the buck. One teaspoon is 4.5 grams of fat. So it's easy to put in your shake, put on your salad, take it off the spoon, do whatever you want to do. So I suggest that you just do a straight oil. What are your thoughts on relaying this information to um, people that have, that have had a, kind of a standard line of thinking with the food diet for years and years? I missed the last part. Somebody dropped a report. Sorry.
Yeah. In other words, how do you teach or get this point across that this macronutrient ratio is better than what they're doing? Is that your question? Yeah. And, and what, what are they suggesting now? What are you referring to? In other words, you're saying that this is too much protein, too much calories, this is, un this is unhealthy? Yeah. And it's like one of those things, once they build a model, they build something they don't like to say, oh, it was wrong. Listen, I'm going by anecdotal and personal experience. I charted my calories for a year and a half prior to my bodybuilding show. For a year and a half, I tried every calorie and did like test body comps on myself and it was like a human guinea pig and then started doing it with other clients. And this is what I found that worked every time. I'm not a research guy. You know, there's a lot of great research. I don't have the time or it's not even fun for me to go on the internet and look at this stuff. I just say, listen, this is what, this is what I'm reading. You know, I've got a lot of information from Sean and Bill Phillips and, and from other experts. And I said, well, this makes sense. And you see the transformations in these people. How do you relay this message to that group? Perhaps get them here, send them a Swiss pamphlet, sick Ken on, or just say, listen, like here's before and after pictures. Like this is what's working. You know, it's like they're, they're, these old school medical doctors and registered dietitians, they're just stubborn people. And what's happening is they don't realize that we're blowing by them. They're sitting in, this, in the slow lane going, look at this paper I'm reading. They're wrong, they're wrong. And you're blowing by them in the fast lane. Let them just sit there at the side of the road and keep reading. They'll get it. They'll have no choice. You see? How do you feel about uh, cyclic ketogenic diets? Say it again. How do you feel about cyclic ketogenic diets? I would feel a lot better if I could pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> Cyclic ketogenic diets, in other words, a lot of protein, a lot of fat for periods of time. Yeah. yeah, I've heard people say it works like a charm. They fill up, they get stronger, then they get lean. It probably works, but I, I couldn't do it. You know, I'm too busy. To, you know, if you've done it, you look great. It probably works. And there's some individual people who have that system that do much better on fat and protein from a ketogenic than a glucogenic standpoint, cellularly to burning it and making muscle, etc. You see? It's a little beyond the scope of what we're talking about here, but I, I think it can work. But I think this will work for the 90% of the people we want to get to. You can go back if you're a personal trainer and say, listen, hey, this stuff works. I saw those guys before and after pictures. This makes sense. I'll try it yourself first. And then for 90% of the people, this is going to be the shoe that fits. For some elite people, that could work like a charm. Again, another controversial thing. Is there a limited amount of protein that your body can digest at once? Yes, there is. What is that limit? Well, we don't know. In healthy adults who are athletic, who are chewing their food, not drinking a lot of liquid when they eat, um, I'm telling you, you can, you can handle, you know, as a woman, 30, 35, 40 grams of protein, especially post-workout. You've got to chew your food. You've got to relax. You've got to make sure if you have you've experienced any belching or bloating or fullness, you might need some digestive enzymes that break down that protein at first. But your body should and will accommodate. If it doesn't, then you have to seek out what's wrong. But again, what about the studies on you know, rats that you only do so 60 grams of protein per day? It's garbage. It's, you know, if we read some of Robert Crayon's work, The Carnitine Miracle, he's a pioneer in the research, and he just totally says, listen, it's, stuff, it's hogwash. I don't believe it. I believe in results. That's what I believe in. Good. Okay. Question was, if you want to lose fat and stimulate muscle growth simultaneously, how much should you eat, right? Or what's the ratio? Well, I do 100%, 70% program. Find out your caloric requirement by using that coefficient, 12, 15, 17, and then do a flip-flop. If you're a 100-pound woman and, you know, you're, you're, you're a fast metabolizer, that's 1,700 calories. You want to lose weight, you know, do 70% of that and keep flipping it back and forth. Um, usually the ratio is going to be a one-to-one -one ratio or darn close to it. You know, some people can handle a little more carbohydrate, but I feel that you get the quickest and best results, more of like a 40-40-20 type thing, where your protein and carbohydrates are pretty darn close. Don't be too anal or too strict with this too. Like sometimes you want to have a cheat meal or a cheat day, and Sunday's a good day to do it. Like your free day, you're not training. You have your cheat meal and then go food shopping. So this way you're not freaking out and craving all the stuff and putting stupid things in your cart. 
you see? But one day a week, you know, one or two meals have a cheat day, you see? I think that's important. My views on flexibility and stretching and bodybuilding? Well, I suggest that we just bring Ming and Dr. Mario up here and let them go at it. <laughs> I think that would be an excellent fight with the Brazilian jiu-jitsu and the power squatting. And I think it would be awesome. So let's create some controversy here. Because we still have a day, you know, we still have some stuff. Hey, listen, I stretch before I work out. Three to five minutes, I get warm, I stretch out. You know, I do like a little um, stretch and flex between each set. I don't know if it works. I, you know, if I train biceps, I stretch my bicep, I contract it. You know, so I, I feel that stretching is important, but I'm not an expert like Ming is with respect to the type of specialized stretching. He's the expert on stretching, no doubt about it. So is Ken. I feel, my, before leg day, I do stretch out my hamstrings and my thighs and my calves. I do that for three to five minutes, and then I'm trying to get in and get out. That's my view. Yeah. yeah, obviously you want to stick to your medium to lower glycemic index carbohydrates. You want to stay away from the sugars and the cakes and the white breads and the stuff like that. Of course, you know, an authorized list of carbohydrates, you know, your, your brown rice, your oatmeals. You know, I think sweet potatoes are still fine yams. I find most guys still do fine with potatoes, quite frankly, when they're mixed with like the chicken breast. What are your thoughts on the pro-hormones? Excuse me? The pro-hormones, like the growth hormone releasers? You know what? I, I, I took one brand like four or five months ago, and it seemed to work. But it was 100 bucks, and I said, I'm not spending another 100 bucks on it. That, that's my take on it. I think that there's probably some validity there. It was a homeopathic to my own growth hormone release. And it seemed to definitely work. I recovered quicker. It seemed like I got leaner. But I really didn't know any information about it. And I think it's something that maybe, I feel that if you do this, you're going to get to your goal. And then if you need something, you know, with all the stuff, the creatine, the glutamine, the rest, the four-day workout, you will get to your goal. It'll be easy on your mind, easy on your pocketbook, easy on your body, and you'll prevent injuries. I don't know if we need to do all this stuff at the level that most people are at. That's my view. With respect to the uh, super, super recovery, how much stronger can you be at the peak of that super yeah. recovery? And number two... That window of opportunity, I may have missed it, but is there a time frame or is there a telltale, telltale sign of yeah. when you know you could be in that window? The, the first question is I find that, I mean, it's hard to put a percentage of how much stronger are you, but you will pick up that weight. Like when you're training biceps on Wednesday and you will realize, you're like, man, this bicep is fuller. And it, I tell you, it is stronger. I think it can be 10 to 15% stronger just trying to throw a number at you. Second question was... If there's a time oh, frame wait, or a uh, time frame. It's usually about 24 hours. You know, it's usually about, it's that day. So you, you, if you miss it, you miss it. But I'm telling you, and simultaneously, you keep doing those workouts, you will start to see the changes. No doubt. What is your stance on um, metabolic enhancers? Okay, like the ephedrine, aspirin, caffeine stack. What's my stance on it? Like this. <laughs> Where you been all damn day? That's my stance on it. I can't do it no more. My girlfriend said she's definitely gonna leave me. I'm burnt, baby. Um, I'm fried. Now, my stance on its effectiveness or its safety? Effectiveness, it works. Would you agree? Does Casperin F does it work? Woo! It works. It, the workouts are phenomenal and you get lean. The safety, it's really not that safe. You know, men have to be careful with prostate, you'll burn your adrenal glands out. It's not that safe. You can wreck some relationships along the way. And again, you can get to, I'm telling you, 7 8% body fat doing that. See, what happens is you start to remove that stuff. Then, see, what I found was when I was using that stuff a lot, then I couldn't go to the gym without it. I needed it. It's, a tr it, it, it's like a drug, you see? It is a drug. It's having a drug-like effect on your metabolism. And it, it really, really, really works. But it's a game you can't win long term. Because what's our goal? Lean, healthy body. Not too many people are going to get up on stage. If you want to get up on stage or win a powerlifting show, you might need it. But in my opinion, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a road you want to travel down. Yeah. Well, 
I, I would, you got to go cold turkey. Yeah, and that's the time they don't train for seven to ten days. They rest. They do some power walking. If they still want to go to the gym, have them do calves or something. So listen, take seven days off. Relax. He's got room in his jacuzzi. He'll, he'll see her. You got room? He's full now. Find a young stud with a jacuzzi and just relax. A lot of vitamin C, pantothenic acid, maybe some adrenal support. Take it easy. Yeah, do you need the cycle creatine? I, I feel you don't need the cycle creatine. If you want to stay on creatine as long as you want to stay strong and stay big. I, my cycle is when I get too lazy to take it. It's, no, no, glutamine. If you're training, I, I, take glutamine. If you're training, take glutamine. Period. I think everyone should take glutamine. I love glutamine. In the old days? Um, how many weeks do I go hard before I cycle off? Six to eight. And I do believe you need at least five days off, straight, nothing, and then go back again. At least five days. That's really critical. Two more questions. Uh, the window for your next year, your next once a week, is super broken. So you know, the question is? So if I've been out that's competing, and in the event that you need his legs for anaerobic activity, I'm going to train a week before and get legs long. This is based on, I'll probably answer your question, this is based on maximum recovery time to grow as much muscle as you can in that leg. Now, if you're doing other stuff like triathlons and running. I don't know if it's a short duration, but I want to get What type of competing? Oh, like a... Like short duration, two minute, high intensity poles. Yeah, it, it, I would say it would work, but I wouldn't go ballistic that Saturday prior. I would do light to moderate. I would just get a little bit of stimulation and rest real well the next, you know, six days afterwards. You see? And quite frankly, I'm going to tell you straight up, calves can and should be trained more frequently. And some people will find that they need to stimulate hamstrings a little quicker than within six to seven days. But to make your life easy, and that's part of this program, just blast those hamstrings out with, uh, with legs, with thighs, and sometimes do the hamstrings first. You see? It's important. One more question. How did your uh, program apply to your like, injury like, uh, Yeah, how does this program apply to a, a triathlete or marathon runner? <coughs> I have no idea. <laughs> because I've really, I've never worked with them, and I, I think they would have a hard time perhaps doing this. This, this would be probably too intense for them. That's my gut feeling. Yeah. Give yourselves a round of applause. You guys are awesome. Don't I get like a bird with a, a ceramic something? Where's Ken? There it is. I'm waiting for this damn bird. <laughs>